Well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Emmett Collins. I am the chair of the board of IPAC Manitoba, and I'm very pleased today to welcome you to our event on digital government for public servants. Um, before we get any further, I would like to begin by acknowledging that IPAC Manitoba is located on the ancestral lands of the Anishinaabe, Ininawuk, Anishinawuk, Dakota, and Dene, and on the homeland of the Métis. We acknowledge the distinct histories of the seven numbered treaties that apply on this land. We recognize that public administration and public policy have been used as tools of colonialism and the harm this has caused Indigenous people. We are committed to promoting public administration in a way that advances reconciliation in a spirit of collaboration with Indigenous people and communities. If you are not familiar with IPAC Manitoba, uh, we are a recognized leader in research, training, knowledge sharing, and outreach, including hosting a large number of conferences and events just like this one, held regionally and nationally. Our membership or organization works on with all levels of government to promote quality public service and practices. We're known for our role in engaging new and experienced public servants to expand their networks and advance excellence in public sector organizations in Manitoba. Uh, you can find more about IPAC Manitoba and IPAC generally by going to IPAC.ca. Um, but uh, that's without any further ado, I'd like to introduce our moderator for this event. So Guy Gordon, I think probably many of you know Guy. Uh, if you worked in digital government at all in the Manitoba government for the past several years, uh, I was omnipresent. He was a, a senior leader in many different roles with the Manitoba government uh, and is currently working as the chief government officer for two Toronto-based startups, as well as providing digital consulting services for the Yukon government and Sport Yukon. So Guy is very well placed to moderate this discussion and uh, without any further ado, I'll pass it to Guy. Uh, welcome, everybody, and thanks, Emmett. A real pleasure to be helping out IPAC uh, at Manitoba and IPAC is, uh, uh, as well. Um, it's, uh, it's great to be back amongst the fold, um, and I'm really pleased to be here with a lot of uh, colleagues, former colleagues, and, um, and who knows, maybe amongst some of you future colleagues. Um, the format for today is we're going to uh, have a series of short presentations. Uh, we'll be starting with uh, with Ryan Andersoff. Um, I'm going to introduce everybody right now very quickly. I will have a series of uh, presentations, which I think um, will be bookended by uh, Ryan, as I say, uh, Nikki at the at the end. Uh, secondly, we'll go to Sasha, and then we'll go to Anna. Each of them will bring a very, very um, unique but very, very important perspective to today's question. Um, after that, there will be a, a, a forum by which we can um, uh, take questions from the audience, and that will be in the form of, of questions that are coming through from the from the chat function. And um, should there be any sort of dead air, I will uh, take it upon myself to uh, to uh, engage these wonderful folks, which won't take much work at all because they are all super engaging. So with that being said, let me just quickly introduce uh, our amazing panel that represents uh, folks from coast to coast. Um, we have a nice uh, mix of local and, and um, well, I guess, you know, uh, uh, and national perspectives. So first of all, uh, Ryan Andersoff, who's the Director of Dig Digital Leaderships uh, for the Institute of Governance. Um, Ryan, I, I've had the pleasure of meeting Ryan. I've had the pleasure of listening to Ryan. I'm, and I show, those of you who had that pleasure, I'm sure that's why you're back today. Those of you who haven't, um, you know, Ryan has an amazing perspective and uh, will give, will do, set us off uh, on our way. Uh, second, uh, after that, is we're going to hear from Sasha Tregobov. Sasha has his uh, family connections back to Winnipeg. Uh, I've sat down here in town over coffee as Sasha has been in visiting the family, going up to the lake in the summertime. Uh, but Sasha's with the uh, behavioral insight team who are really the, the grandfathers, the grandmothers, the, 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 the grandparents of behavioral insights. Um, that is a, a, an effort that I, I will say um, I tried along with Angela and Scott Sinclair to get rolling off the ground. It's still 
lays nascent, ready to be picked up at the right time. But Sasha, I think, will start um, setting some fires and giving people a tremendous inspiration, particularly as it is one of the most pragmatic and practical applications of digital. It doesn't require millions of dollars. It doesn't require anybody to have uh, coding expertise. It just takes some common sense and some ability to um, ask the kind of questions you asked yourself in grade six science. Right. Um, if you can do grade six science, you have a good starting point to uh, to to understand the power of behavioral insights. Uh, Anna Slavina is the director of I'm very proud to say um, uh, uh, data science for the Department of uh, Central Services. Uh, through uh, Scott's work, who I know very well, Scott is a real leader and a forethinker in terms of being able to apply um, uh, uh, data science and analytics to the application of public administration, and I know uh, Anna's doing wonderful things there. And lastly, uh, a colleague and a friend and a co-collaborator uh, and a co-conspirator, uh, Nikki Albi, who um, I think you'll you'll see her work with the um, uh, the digital um, uh, uh, services in on, in Ontario um, is really groundbreaking, and her ability and focus on reaching out to the the masses of public servants who want to wrap their head around what does this mean, and how can I get involved, and how do I make it applicable to my job, and how do I become a uh, how do I deliver better services to Canadians from coast to coast to coast? She's uh, she's the person you want to hear from. So, with that being said. Um, Ryan, I'm going to turn it over to you. You have the controls and you're going to drive the bus for the next uh, five to seven minutes. Great. Thanks so much, Guy. And uh, great to be here with my fellow panelists and with all of you today uh, to talk about one of my favorite topics. Um, I'm going to uh, share my screen and I think you should all be able to see my slides now um, up on your screen. Um, and I'm going to take a, a few minutes this morning, I guess, to do a little bit of obscene setting with you just to, to share a little bit about what I see as being some of the big trends that are impacting government um, around this thing we call digital um, and what some of the implications are that I'm seeing in the work um, that I do through the Institute on Governance and some of the consulting work that I do with clients um, across the country. And I like to start talks like this by talking about what we mean when we talk about digital. Because I think, you know, digital can absolutely be a buzzword. Um, it means a lot of different things to different people. Uh, this is a definition that I like to use. Uh, it comes from a gentleman named Tom Lucemore. Tom was one of the co-founders of the Government Digital Service in the UK. Um, and Tom talks about digital as being the application of the culture, practices, processes, and technologies of the internet era to respond to people's raised expectations. And I think this definition does a good job of kind of setting up this two-sided equation. Because I think on the one hand, importantly, it's saying that digital is about more than just technology. Technology is obviously a big part of what's driving it. But there are these ways of working, these kind of cultural aspects to digital. If you kind of think about your mental model of a Silicon Valley startup, that probably is kind of a good equivalency to what they're talking about when he talks about the culture practices and processes that are part and parcel of the technology. So it's this new way of working that's empowered by technology. But it also on the other side talks about this notion of people's raised expectations. And you know, the reality is that the citizens that all of you who work in government serve are also living in a Google and Netflix and Amazon world. And even more so now through what we've gone through over the last 18 months during COVID, it has really kind of changed the notion of people's expectations around the quality and the quantity of online services that they're able to deliver. And I do think this definition kind of gets at what has been driving a lot of behavior in governments around all things digital. Um, in the Canadian context, I think there's been this kind of three-step evolution we've seen over the last few decades in digital. Um, you know, for those of you who were in government 20 plus years ago, you might, you might remember what at the federal level people were calling government online. More globally, it was kind of the e-government movement. This was really about people responding to the existence of the internet, which before the mid 1990s was not something that was commonly available to most people. And there was a lot of effort that went in at the national level, at provincial levels, municipal governments as well, to essentially take services and information and for the very first time, put them online, make them available to anybody 
anywhere at any time. Uh, and Canada was actually widely seen as a leader in what they were calling e-government in the early 2000s. You know, there was global rankings around e-government. Uh, Canada would be typically at the top of that list. We then in kind of the mid 2000s, mid 2010s, saw this next phase of what people were calling government 2.0. Um, and this was really about the rise of social media. You know, these new platforms like Facebook and Twitter and LinkedIn, things we take for granted today were, you know, brand new for society as a whole and governments in particular. And it really started changing the dynamic about how government communicated to citizens, but importantly, how they engaged with citizens and starting to kind of move that from being kind of a one directional sharing of information to much more participatory, ideally, um, and having a many different dynamics around citizen engagement. This was also very much about the rise of open government um, and sharing information, including kind of raw data sets, um, started being something that governments in the last decade have really started to embrace and a lot of interesting implications from that that we could talk about more later. Then in the last few years, I said the last five or six years in particular, there has been this new movement that people are increasingly calling digital government. And I do think this phase that we're now in is different than those previous ones. It builds on that, but it's actually about saying, how do we take advantage of technology to rethink our processes from the bottom up and reimagine what government looks like in this digital era? Like digital, there's a lot of different definitions for what digital government means. Um, this is a definition from my former team at the OECD. I'd spent uh, a year there uh, about five, six years ago. Um, and this is the definition that, that the OECD uses around digital government. And two things I'll kind of point out in this. One, that it talks about digital government as being part of a modernization strategy. So it's more than just service delivery. It's about this deeper modernization to government organizations. And secondly, the idea that it's an ecosystem approach. It's not government doing it alone, but it's government working with citizens, with businesses, with, with nonprofit organizations, with academia. Um, and it kind of blurs the traditional boundaries of how we think about government reform and, and government modernization efforts. So implicit in this whole idea of digital government is this real transformation of the organization and how it works. And I, I kind of have this very simple model, which I call the digital government pyramid, to help kind of think about that a little bit. Um, you know, and I think in a lot of government organizations, and perhaps not surprisingly, given their traditional hierarchical nature, we start with leadership and policy. And I think a lot of the activity we've seen in the digital government space in the last decade has really been about from a leadership level, trying to say, you know, what are the types of policies, legislation in some cases we need to modernize, um, pilot projects and initiatives that are driven from the top to, to show new ways of working, new ways of approaching things. And this is ultimately about impacting what I tend to call the, the platforms and processes layer of government. This is kind of the messy middle in terms of how things are done, how services are delivered, how we work in government. But I would make the argument that leadership and policy by itself is not enough and hasn't been enough. Um, and over the last few years, we're seeing an increasing focus on the base of the pyramid, what I kind of call the people and skills layer. Um, I know Nikki's going to talk to you about this more later on uh, this morning, um, but I think it's really this combination between leadership and policy and people and skills that is starting to be able to move us to change how government works. Um, I've been quite personally involved in working in the people and skills area for the last few years. Um, I spent a number of years inside the federal government, and for the last four years now, I've been doing a mix of training and consulting and work with government agencies across Canada, um, really trying to address this issue of the skills gap and, and creating um, a space for leaders within government to be able to learn digital era competencies. Um, through the work I do with the Institute on Governance, we have a digital executive leadership program that we run a few times a year. Um, we actually are coming up on our 10th cohort of this program at the end of this month, and we've had folks from a whole variety of federal departments as well as provincial, municipal, and nonprofit organizations participate. Um, you know, and our program is structured to give people introduction to digital government um, and some of the big trends. We do a deep dive into design thinking, into digital technology and into data science, um, and then look at kind of what I call our taking action day, these modern ways of working, 
working in an agile way, building multidisciplinary teams and helping people think through how they can bring this back to the classroom. Um, you know, we use a variety of different approaches to, to address these issues and to help executives understand it. Um, and really it's about, you know, in my mind, helping people to demystify some of those buzzwords that are out there to have a more digitally strategic and savvy leadership in their organizations. And, and at the end of the day, to be able to ask better questions and build a peer network, peer network that they can pull on for success in the future. Um, and, you know, coming out of the work that we've done through this program over the last few years, um, there's some really interesting trends that we've seen from those who've come through our classroom, both in person and virtual over the last 18 months. And I wanted to share these with you because I think they're probably good food for thought and fodder for the discussion that we'll have a little bit later on. And so, you know, from the hundreds of executives that we've had a chance to do digital leadership training with, I think, you know, we've definitely heard loud and clear that digital is no longer just an IT thing. I think there is this sense that it has moved beyond simply being a back office function that is just the purview of the CIO and is now something that is impacting everybody's job in a whole variety of different ways. Um, and there is a real appreciation that taking user-centered approaches, working in an agile fashion is where people want to be going within government. But the ways of working in public service, and I think this is true at all levels of government, have largely speaking not caught up, right? And we consistently hear about challenges around budgeting processes, project gating, procurement, HR, um, amongst others, that are still stuck in a mindset that may be decades out of date. And so I think there's this tension between moving towards a user-centered, agile way of working and the processes and ways of working in government having not yet caught up. Um, certainly the rise of social media and other digital tools accelerated even more so because of COVID and our move to remote work has opened up huge possibilities for sharing, for gathering information. But there also is this sense of it being overwhelming and being able to sort out, you know, fact from fiction has become a challenge, not just in broader society, but what I'm finding amongst government executives as well. Um, and a deep sense of transformation fatigue. I think we've gone through multiple waves of transformation in the last decade at all levels of government in Canada, and COVID again is bringing upon this new wave of transformation as people think about the new normal. Um, and speaking of COVID, of course, you know, the elephant in the room when it comes to digital these last 18 months is really the impact COVID has had, not just on how government delivers services to citizens, but internally how government works itself. Um, you know, and all of you have lived this in one way or the other through your work over the last 18 months, and I think lots we can kind of dive into on this in our discussion. So my final thought before I, I pass the baton back over to Guy. Um, uh, there's this quote from Scott Bryson, who was our former uh, Treasury Board Minister for the federal government and Canada's first Minister of Digital Government. Um, and he was fond of saying, in the 21st century, you're either digital or you're dead. Um, and I think there's truth behind that. That's certainly true if you're in the private sector. But I would argue in government, there is a third option and, and a perhaps even riskier option, which is becoming a digital zombie. Um, you know, government sometimes becomes the epitome of being too big to fail. And, and I think, you know, we run the risk sometimes as we look at digital transformation in government, that government does just enough to kind of keep moving, but not enough to truly transform itself. And I would argue that's actually one of the biggest challenges governments are facing today. There is inevitable digitization that's happening in all levels because of society in part sped up because of, of the impacts of COVID. But there is a real risk that government doesn't truly embrace um, transformation in terms of how the organization works itself. Um, and I would just leave it to say that technology change in and of itself is not enough. I think truly embracing the digital government mindset requires a deeper transformation to the organization. Um, and that's certainly the work that I'm engaged with and happy to talk with all of you a little bit later in the Q&A about what that means and be very interested to hear your experiences in Manitoba and beyond on this. So thanks so much. I'm going to leave it at that for, for some opening thoughts. And uh, Guy, I'll pass it back to you. Well, thanks. Thanks, Ryan. Um, that was really great. And I and I love, I love the what you've given us lots to think about, lot to chew on. Uh the, the digital zombie man. Um, if we have if there is dead space, I'm gonna I'm gonna go off on that one for a second. But before that, let's turn it off, uh, turn it over to Sasha. Um, uh, Sasha, you, I'll just leave it to you, your work with the behavioral insights group, uh, and behavioral insights has been fascinating and groundbreaking and, um, and something that, um, uh, speaks to practical, 
questions with practical uh, uh, tests and practical values. So over to you, sir. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Uh, hopefully everybody can see my, uh, uh, my screen there. Um, thank you for the kind introduction, uh, 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 Guy, and thank you to IPAC uh, Manitoba for inviting me to participate. Uh, uh, here, as, as Guy said, uh, my whole family is, is from the Winnipeg area, and so it always feels sort of extra special when I get to uh, address uh, uh, folks working in and around public service in the province. So um, uh, as Guy mentioned, my name is Sasha Tregobov. I've got the enormous uh, uh, pleasure and privilege of leading the Canadian division of an organization called the Behavioral Insights Team. Um, today, I want to briefly define what the heck I mean. Uh, by behavioral insights for those who aren't as familiar with the with the terminology, but then quite quickly get into three sort of specific and concrete ways that behavioral insights um, can support the effectiveness uh, and efficiency and sort of leverage the potential of digital government initiatives. So if you are uh, planning or um, uh, operating uh, digital government services or other digital government initiatives, these are the sort of three things that I would recommend to you uh, from my expertise and my, organized, uh, my organization's expertise in, in behavioral science. Um, so, so first, uh, what, what is behavioral insights? Uh, I, think, I think the best definition uh, uh, out there is, is, is this one. Uh, it comes from a book a couple of my colleagues wrote simply titled Behavioral Insights. Um, it's a great primer for those interested in, in digging in. Um, and uh, here we understand behavioral insights to uh, be uh, the approach that uses evidence of both the conscious and non-conscious drivers of human behavior to address practical issues. So in other words, this discipline of behavioral insights draws from the research conducted by behavioral economists, by social psychologists, by neuroscientists about um, how human beings process information, make decisions and behave, including all of the shortcuts that our minds um, are taking to navigate through uh, the enormously complex and challenging world uh, that we live in. And, and it sort of takes those ideas, those findings, those insights, those methodologies uh, out of academia and brings it into the practical day-to-day -day work um, of, of uh, public sector organizations. Okay, so three ways that behavioral insights uh, can support digital uh, uh, government. So the first one is um, improving digital experiences. So whether these are employee experiences or more likely quote unquote end user, uh, you know, resident experiences with digital government services. Uh, behavioral insights can um, inform the uh, user experience, user interface design in concrete and practical ways. So take the behavioral science concept of friction costs or as they're sometimes also known, hassle costs. So this comes from the basic uh, um, insight that people have limited cognitive bandwidth. They have limited mental resources. Um, there's only so much information our brains can process. There's only so much we can navigate in, in a day. And so to respond to this limitation, our brains are constantly searching out reasons to avoid cognitively challenging tasks. We're always looking to, uh, I guess you could say, take the easy way out. And so what that means from a design of digital government services is that every tiny bit of additional effort or complexity that we are asking of our users acts as a cue telling them, hey, give up, stop doing this task uh, altogether. And behavioral insights then tells us to minimize these hassles or frictions to the greatest extent possible. And let me give you an example from one of the simplest, but I think most powerful projects um, that my organization, the Behavioral Insights Team, uh, ha has done. So this is sort of picking one out of about 900 uh, uh, applied government projects here. So this was in the UK, and the government of the UK was sending a letter to people that were late filing their taxes. And it said, hey, we've got this nifty new digital service. Um, follow this URL that we're giving you. It'll take you to a web page. And from there, you can click through uh, to a form to file your taxes online. 
And what the government found is that uh, within about a month um, of sending this letter, they had about a 19% response rate of people going ahead and filing their tax form online. And so we looked at this process and we said, you know, there's a friction. There's a little hassle here that doesn't need to be here. And it has to do with the link taking them to a web page. And then on that web page, needing to click the first link. So it wasn't too hard. They had done a pretty good job, but they had to click the top link on that web page to access the top the tax form. And what we said is, well, even though it's only one click, that click might matter. Let's get rid of it. Let's instead create a URL that links people that are receiving this letter directly to the tax form. And so what we did is we evaluated this change, this very simple change to the URL in the letter to eliminate a single click from a digital process. And we evaluated it through a very rigorous methodology called a randomized control trial. I won't get too into that um, today, but I will talk about that methodology, uh, which is sort of uh, deeply associated with behavioral insights um, uh, in a couple of minutes. And what we found is people who received the direct link to the tax form responded at a 23% rate instead of a 19% rate. And you may say, well, that's a small difference. And I suppose it is, but that's an 18% relative increase in the desired behavior of completing the tax form online, all from removing a single click. So imagine if you were to go through comprehensively um, all of the hassles or frictions in your digital government services and remove them. What types of improvements and outcomes might you be able to see? And of course, simplification and the notion of hassle or frictions costs is just one of dozens of specific strategies from behavioral insights that can be designed to how digital government services are, are sort of uh, designed and how they're communicated to users and potential users. Uh, but of course, uh, you've got other really excellent speakers coming up. Sorry, that presumes that I'm one. You have uh, excellent speakers coming up, uh, I should say. So I won't get into all of those strategies right now. So what's the second use case? Well, the second use case is all about digital channel shift. So when you've got a whole bunch of users that are used to renewing their license uh, uh, plates or updating their health information or uh, paying their taxes in non-digital ways, and now you've built these digital services which are gonna reduce error rates, reduce costs, improve customer service, you need to get them over to the new channel. So we were doing some work with the city of Denver um, in the US and, and they had just, uh, they were working on license plate renewals um, and they had just developed this quite, quite excellent uh, digital service. And they were trying to get people aware of that and switched over to it. And so what we did is we, we helped them design a little postcard uh, that, they, that they mailed out um, uh, to, 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 to people uh, that had their renewal coming up soon. Um, and you can see here, hopefully you can see on the screen what this looked like, extremely simple, but um, it, it leveraged this uh, really powerful behavioral insight that's called implementation intentions. And what that insight tells us is that people are more likely to follow through with an action if they set and in fact write down a specific actionable plan of what they're going to do. So here we prompted them to write down specifically when they were going to complete these actions and how they were going to complete these actions. And we broke down that license plate renewal process into a series of steps to make it even simpler. And then remembering what we had learned from our work on simplification, we also uh, went so far as to do things like shorten the URL, right? Extra, every extra little letter that you have to type into your browser is a friction. And so as part of this postcard, we used a shortened um, URL, which is a very sort of simple innovation. Many services do this. And so here, what we found is that these postcards increased digital channel shift. Again, we tested this scientifically through a randomized controlled trial, and we saw an 8%, 8 percentage point increase in, um, in, in online license plate uh, renewals, which, which certainly achieved 
uh, the department's operational uh, uh, goals, at least in the first year of this service. So, so in, in sort of plainer numbers, uh, that was 9,000 more online renewals um, uh, than if we hadn't sort of sent this. And, and so overall here, um, at, at the Behavioral Insights team, we are not big fans of the movie Field of Dreams. And I realize I may be dating myself with this reference. Um, but, but, you know, if you, if you saw that, that movie, the tagline of the movie was, if you build it, uh, they will come. Um, but, but really, when it comes to digital government services, you, I would really recommend against that mentality. You need to have clear and effective strategies uh, to affect digital channel shift, and those strategies should be informed uh, by behavioral insights. So now I'll go to the third and uh, final um, uh, use case here, which is the enormous potential that digital government has to really realize this vision of evidence-based or evidence-informed government. So as you can see from the previous two case studies, at BIT, we love to rigorously evaluate our ideas uh, with a preference for something called a randomized controlled trial. And rigorous evaluation is a critical component of evidence-informed public administration. Um, but the reality is it, it's, it's often not easy and, and it's often quite resource intensive, um, especially given that most public sector organizations have, have limited sort of scientific evaluation capacity. Um, now, digital government radically shifts uh, that challenge. High quality evaluation of digital services is significantly easier. In, in my own experience, um, trials um, uh, 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 on digital services are five to 10 times less costly and time intensive uh, than, than field experiments in non-digital services. So what I'd like to leave you with is the idea that, that governments can increasingly become uh, like uh, the company Duolingo, <laughs> uh, which um, which uh, uh, helps people learn new languages. It's a it's a phone app. You know what do you call it? A, a mobile app. Um, and 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 Duolingo, like most of these, uh, you know, digital app, large digital app companies. Uh, really leverages uh, the potential to do uh, rigorous testing. So it's run over 3,000 randomized controlled trials or A-B tests as they're often called in the digital world, um, gauging user responses to uh, you know, the smallest features to the largest. And at any given time, it may be running 200 different evaluations on its platform. So it has gone so far as to when a user is not completing their lessons, they get this sad owl. And it has actually evaluated how large the owl's tears should be to guilt users into coming back to their language lessons, which is sort of hilarious. But, but the more sort of practical example that I wanted to give is this question that a lot of digital government um, initiatives come into of when do we need users to provide us with information? In this case, when do we need them to create a profile or an account? And what Duolingo found through a series of trials was that requiring users to create an account early on really limited engagement. A lot of people were just dropping out altogether. And what they found was optimal was a series of three, what they call soft gates, where you could postpone the decision to sort of register your information and continue using the service until finally, um, after you were in sort of your fourth lesson uh, and had really seen the value of the digital application, you would then be required uh, to register. Um, uh, uh, to continue to use the service. And that sort of optimization of those soft gates um, led to an 8% increase in, in sort of daily average uh, users on the, on the platform. So, so you know, in, in sum, let's use behavioral insights to improve the digital experience through things like simplification. Let's use it to, uh, to, to sort of shift uh, users onto our newly developed or reinvigorated online services, and let's really leverage the rigorous scientific scientific um, uh, testing uh, capabilities that digital platforms offer to deliver on the promise of truly evidence-based uh, public administration. Wonderful, Sasha. Thank you. So um, moving along, uh, let's let's go to Anna, um, who I think will, for those of us who work for the province of Manitoba or worked for the province of Manitoba, uh, I think you'll find Anna's um, uh, 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 update on the use of data and data science uh, to be really interesting. So Anna, over to you. Hello, everyone. Um, so I'm going to 
everyone. Uh, thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to come to speak uh, to this group um, and to have this, uh, you know, fascinating and invigorating, invigorating conversation. Um, so in my presentation today, I'll take you through what we have done in the data science program uh, in the government of Manitoba to try to drive or suss out uh, a lot of value out of the enormous amount of information that is collected by uh, governments, you know, through ongoing processes, um, all the way through, you know, the type of data that might be available online, and how we've used that information to really drive evidence based decision making um, and create value out of the data resources that governments have available to them. Um, just as a high level uh, introduction. Um, so I, I lead the data science program uh, within the government of Manitoba. Um, our mandate uh, within my team is really to work across departments in order to provide end to end uh, data analytics services, all the way from you know data management and data wrangling bringing that data into a usable format, all the way through developing our predictive models uh, and predictive analytics uh, through finally delivering um, data products to our client departments, be those interactive applications or static infographics and reports. Um, you know, when, when thinking about data science and the value of data analytics uh, within government, we really start from the understanding that data is a valuable commodity. Um, if you think about, you know, the amount of financial value that private sector companies derive out of their data by selling it to others um, or for using it for decision making, uh, you know, you start to understand the kind of scope of it. And government collects data uh, through passive processes um, or through actively collecting certain pieces of information that can be used uh, to, you know, create a lot of value and to empower decision makers and governments to reach their goals. And those goals can be diverse. Uh, for instance, you know, we can use data to anticipate and respond to disruptions. Um, this is where predictive analytics becomes really valuable. You know, if we think about the context of COVID-19 and the value of understanding where we might be going in the future um, and government setting up um, all kinds of responses and policies in order to hopefully mitigate uh, that impact. Um, data becomes really valuable when developing client focused service delivery by understanding, you know, who or the characteristics of a target population or a target client through data. Government can create programs that specifically target and meet the needs of those uh, populations. So, for instance, if you're designing a program for, you know, youth at risk of incarceration, you might want to know where those youth live what their educational attainment is and what kinds of prior services have really created impacts for that group. Um, data is also really important for measuring outcomes. So, you know, as we develop policies and programs, we want to know which ones of them are achieving their outcomes and which ones are not, um, and then pivoting in a direction that is hopefully more, uh, you know, uh, appropriate if, if our programs are not achieving their, their goals. And finally, uh, you know, there's the value and importance of evidence based decision making for public accountability. We want to show that the information, uh, you know, that the programs that government is developing are evidence based and actually meeting their targets and explain to the public, uh, you know, in a transparent way, why and how that has occurred. Uh, when we think about data science, again, there's all kinds of definitions about what that means. Um, but very simply and at a very high level, data science can be understood as a set of interdisciplinary tools for the deliberate extraction of information and knowledge from large amounts of data. And data is also really diverse, right? So we can think about data as, um, you know, information on clients. We can think about data as uh, people's chat history on Reddit. Uh, basically any kind of information that can be analyzed in order to um, derive knowledge and insights. Um, and in our work, we have really seen the value of using data uh, for evidence informed decision making as it relates to producing programs that actually produce cost savings that have measurable uh, outcomes, right, that we can target uh, for improvement. Um, and doing all of this while protecting privacy and promoting transparency and accountability. So as I mentioned, uh, in the context of our uh, work in the government of Manitoba, our team provides end-to-end um, -end support 
uh, for various departments across government, all the way from infrastructure to the Department of Families. Um, and we deliver end-to-end -end services. So all the way from helping our departments scope out their question, right? So how do you go from, you know, we want to create this kind of policy to where do we find the data uh, in order to answer that question? What is the best methodology for measuring that? And then finally, backgrounding all of that scary technical work and delivering to our um, clients actually usable insights with actionable implications for policy. We really found it valuable to think about data science and data analytics as a kind of cross government initiative, right? So you might have some pockets within an organization that might have really strong technical expertise, but also within areas you have subject matter experts that need to be able to contextualize the data that a data scientist like one of our team members is working with. So we work really closely, not only across government, but also with external partners, including the academic community um, and various folks, uh, both in and outside uh, of government. Sorry, was I not sharing my screen? I'm so sorry. Sorry about that. Is, is everybody able to see my screen up here? I think I'm sharing, Anna. What, what slide are you on? Let's go here. Uh, I was just on slide five. Perfect. We'll be there right now. Sorry about that, that everybody. Okay, we're good to go. Right. So, uh, sorry, folks, uh, if that was a little bit confusing and a lot of talk with uh, low amounts of visuals behind it. Um, but yeah, as I was saying, you know, this, this image here that you see on your screen is really meant to describe how uh, our unit kind of works across both government and uh, the academic community, in our case, the Manitoba Center for Health Policy or academics and other jurisdictions uh, in order to really, um, you know, develop data science products that are interdisciplinary, that draw on the best knowledge and scientific practices uh, across disciplines. Um, and also engage with the subject matter experts, both within and outside of government, in order to contextualize the data and our findings. Um, just, just next slide, please, Guy. Um, so, you know, in, in doing this, we draw on a diversity of data. So, um, you know, as I mentioned, uh, governments collect a lot of information, but there's also a lot of information available publicly. Uh, for instance, you know, everything from anonymized administrative data sets that government might house um, all the way through uh, private sector data, which can be purchased, for instance, telecommunications data or data from other private sector organizations, and then obviously publicly available data that can be scraped online. So for instance, information from Reddit or Twitter, uh, Kijiji data, all of this information can be used to answer relevant policy questions. So for instance, um, we completed a project using data that we scraped uh, from Kijiji, looking at uh, the real rental cost uh, for various housing units in Manitoba. Um, next one, please. Uh, so just, just as a high level kind of uh, description of some of the projects we've engaged with, and I'm happy to discuss any of these in more detail later on. Um, but we've worked, you know, to develop both predictive and descriptive data analytics products uh, for COVID-19. We've used various economic data sets uh, from outside of government in order to look at COVID-19 recovery. So everything from debt to consumer purchasing habits over time to understand how government policy has impacted that and what the next stage of recovery will be. Uh, you know, we collected uh, information on people's sentiments towards vaccine and vaccine hesitancy by uh, using text analytics to analyze uh, Reddit data, collected thousands of Reddit posts about vaccinations in Manitoba. Um, you know, we've, we're working with various predictive models to look at environmental risk factors and environmental vulnerability. Um, and, you know, our, our work kind of ranges all the way from questions related to social policy, all the way through questions related to transportation and road safety. Um, as part of our core mandate in data science, we also work on helping 
our partner departments and our partners across government uh, to build their own capacity to do some of this work through, um, you know, developing workshops uh, for programming or just for general uh, kind of statistics and, and, and data analytics concepts. So I'll stop there and uh, turn it over to the rest of the presenters. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, uh, and, and just just to say, uh, lots of progress in the last eighteen months since since uh, I last checked in on on your work. So congratulations, things are really coming together, and I, I love the examples you shared. So our last presenter um, before we get into Q and A is Nikki. Uh, Nikki, I'm gonna I actually will pull up your slide here. So um, just give me a moment. You can introduce yourself and and uh, get going. I'll just give me. Uh, 30 seconds to catch up to um, to you. So take it away. Thank you. Um, when uh, when Angela approached me asking me to to be here, probably like Ryan, Sasha, and Anna, although they don't deserve to, um, my first question was why me. Um, and of course, I went to my team saying why me. And uh, my team quickly reminded me of the symbol they use for me all the time, which is a magnet in. Uh, in, in Slack, we use Slack to communicate. And the magnet represents this ability that I seem to have to um, pull people to our team. Um, so in reminding me of that, I think that's what I'm kind of here to talk about today. So I consider myself the cheerleader of the uh, Discovered Digital Training Team from the Ontario Digital Service. Um, I get to live a truly distributed team uh, life. I, I live uh, in a town of about 2,000 people and moving to something even smaller soon. Uh, I and my team are really devoted to diversity, inclusion, and as our um, Deputy Minister Hillary Hartley will always say, um, belonging as well. Um, we, we show this in some of our team training offerings, one of them that I'm most proud of being uh, I am a digital dot, dot, dot. Um, the I am a digital dot, dot, dot is meant to, uh, it's a panel series each month where we bring uh, a panel of underrepresented um, groups together to talk about their experiences. We started a year ago with I am a digital dot, 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 um, black professionals. We've spoken to indigenous communities, people with disabilities, LGBTQ2+, um, uh, new graduates, newcomers to Canada, uh, and our last one was neurodiverse populations. And um, from those, we've had groups that have, uh, as a result, created their own communities of practice or support groups, um, which has been really exciting to hear about. Uh, at the moment, we're also running a course that we've partnered with Apolitical and the Feds, um, which is equity and fairness, uh, any racism in digital government. Um, also really passionate about developing the right culture for our team and um, for our learners. Next slide. I wanted to take a moment to introduce my team. Uh, not necessarily that you need to know who they are, although they all deserve to be in the spotlight. But I wanted to sort of point out that uh, I'm the only person on this tr uh, training team who is devoted strictly to the training team. All of the other members um, serve multiple purposes or on other teams. And just the other day, we had to count up sort of all of our offerings. And at the moment we have, I think it's eight different courses that we're either developing or have rolled out already that uh, are already running. And we do this with this, this team, this amount of people. And this is to say that we need to be really, really creative. So next slide. So this is how we get creative. All of, sorry, go back, guy. Thank you. Um, these people are also our team. Uh, these people are all part of different ministries in the Ontario Public Service. Um, they also have different day jobs and they work with us on the sly. Um, we have programs that we run called a residency. So a residency is how I got to the Ontario Digital Service. Um, a residency is that uh, somebody's home ministry will continue to pay their wage and they get loaned to us to learn different skills, but we just basically snag them and keep them and uh, often they get to stay. Um, so all these people are working in, with us in some capacity. Um, 
and we, to us, that is still our team uh, and have as much, um, they're just superstars. Next slide. Um, about a year and a half ago, I did a project looking at trying to understand what digital skills and mindsets are needed on a digital team. Not gonna go through them all, but uh, this is what we've sort of found. Uh, it's not to say that every team, everybody needs all of these skills and mindsets on the team, but in creating a team, this is what needs to be considered that, that each of these skills or mindsets is represented somewhere. To us, the, the skills and mindsets that are at the center are um, self-awareness. Without self-awareness, we don't feel that you have the ability to sort of understand where you can grow. Um, and so it's really hard to sort of uh, recognize areas of growth within yourself. Um, empathy, of course, like empathy is at the heart of digital and uh, growth mindset. Uh, if you have those three, we believe that you can kind of build on those to, to uh, build the other skills and mindsets within yourself. But we also recognize that those are the hardest ones to sort of build within people. And we're still trying to work out how to help somebody to understand their level of self-awareness, empathy, and a growth mindset to be able to build on those. Our team believes in working in a digital way to build uh, the training that we do deliver. We spend a lot of time understanding our learners and there's probably nothing specific here to the Ontario Public Service. We've done a lot of work with other teams across Canada to understand what other learners um, value. And we found that it's the same thing, not just across Canada, but also in talking to partners like Apolitical. What we do find though, is that public servants really struggle with the term digital. And we can't wait for the term digital to be gone and that we just say government. Um, and this, like I heard Ryan say it in his opening um, presentation as well, and how we continue to have this issue and nobody has found a solution, I don't know. Um, but it seems to be that we're always trying to get somebody else to, to find a solution to this. But um, that term digital in itself is, is our biggest barrier, I think, to engaging learners. We also found that learners work, learn best when they have an opportunity to ask questions and when the learning is meaningful to them at the time that they need it. Um, and we found that there's, uh, we need to sort of re-understand re the term training or education or skills development or whatever you want to call it. Once upon a time, it was sitting in a classroom or a workshop and learning and it's not that anymore. Um, mentoring is a learning opportunity, uh, AMAs, like there's so many different ways that we can be learning and, and we just need to sort of rethink that. For us, we've learned, spent some time to understand our challenges. Um, the challenges being, as I sort of mentioned, that this term digital gets in the way for so many people uh, and we're trying to work out how to engage different people the offerings that we that I sort of spoke to with the I am a digital dot 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 is a way to show people that everybody has a place in digital um, and that we are all part of this and um, we're all invited to be part of this. Um, but there's also for our team, because I showed you how, how small our team is, there is a need for this basic like what does it mean to be digital? It's so like a digital 101 and just engaging people in it but also getting more into deeper specific training. Um, so that's something that we struggle in as well. But in understanding that we can sort of make partnerships that help us to overcome these without having to do it all ourselves. Next slide. Um, we also need to do a better job of understanding the skills that are needed and the jobs that are available and the skills that we all have um, and what's available currently within different levels of government, which is something that, that we're also trying to work on. We need to start to break down the silos. Um, and I can sort of talk in a moment about how our team has been able to do that specifically. Um, and again, like I said, that, you know, there's a lot of informal learning opportunities like mentorships, uh, coaching, etc., which not always valued in public service as being uh, credible training, but it really is and we need to sort of really under, start to look at training and skills development differently. 
For our team, um, we use a methodology called learning experience design. So when you think of digital and you think of the methodology behind bu building digital products and services, you usually think of service design. Learning experience design, um, LXD, is the, the learning um, solution, the learning methodology that is the equivalent kind of service design. It is putting the learner at the center of the design process, ensuring that um, rather than building uh, learning that is sort of instructor led, it's understanding what the learner wants to learn, how they wanna learn and developing for them. We wanna spend a lot of time focusing on the skills and mindsets um, rather than just specific job roles. Um, the, di the digital skills and mindsets that we identified are the same whether you're in um, municipal government, the prov provincial or the federal, wherever you are, these are, these are common skills and mindsets. And they're also, some of them are common across all the job roles. So focusing on developing those to start with and building on those is what we're trying to do. We try to build courses at different levels to provide opportunities for people to sort of really understand at different levels where they are. Um, our team is really, really good at building relationships, um, building relationships, not just within the Ontario Public Service, but across Canada. And I'd like to take a moment just to sort of speak to that. Um, when one of the offering that uh, we created that was, that was where I met Angela, and Guy uh, was developing a boot camp called um, the How to Be Digital in the Canadian Public Service Boot Camp. Uh, our team had partnered with Apolitical. Um, if you're unfamiliar with Apolitical, they're a, a private company um, that are working to build, you know, uh, to promote uh, problem solving in public servants. They believe that um, that building that public servants can cr then can create change, um, can solve a lot of, you know, uh, sort of social problems uh, globally and by empowering public servants, we can, we can work on that together. So we had partnered with them and had started building sort of for Ontario only and realized that doing that was kind of against what we feel that digital is Digital doesn't mean hoarding resources for yourself and creating for yourself. It does mean being more efficient and sharing. So we started to talk to training teams from across Canada and um, how we could work together. And we, the first course that we did, we had teams from Yukon, uh, Alberta, Manitoba, uh, Saskatchewan, the federal government, and Nova Scotia, I believe it is. And I made MBC, and uh, we built this thing together and had over 5,400 public servants Canada wide register. And as a result of that course, um, we developed a working group that still remains today. We've added a couple of other provinces as well. We meet every two months to talk about um, what we're offering and how we can share those offerings that we're not all sort of reinventing the wheel and, and um, you know, how we can be more efficient, what we know about our learners um, and how we can do things better. Um, so that's something that we're most proud of. Next slide. Um, some of the other boot camps, um, because of this relationship that we have, especially with the federal government, they gave us um, their curriculum um, and we, uh, changed it to be specific to Ontario and created a Discover Digital for Leaders series. We've now had 520 leaders within the Ontario Public Service Register, um, and that's within the last like five or six months. 100% um, of those who have graduated that program agree that uh, they have a better understanding of digital concepts and mindsets. And part of that course is to uh, take our Ontario Digital Service Standard and put it to action. And there have been some incredible um, projects that have started and that have continued and have changed the way people work already. And that's kind of it for me. 
Wonderful. Well, thank you. I'm glad to see that we still got lots of folks here. Um, so now I'm going to turn to this session, the section of the session to sort of um, open up um, uh, some comments and some questions. Um, so let's let's uh, have a look at what we've got coming through here. So maybe one just for you. Um, and it's in the theme of, um, uh, to you, Nikki, um, how do you make belonging happen in a distributed team? And I, and I, I guess as we're all here, uh, uh, and Zoom is, is now a, a big part of our lives, uh, how have you been successful in kind of uh, making a sense of belonging rather than sort of a, um, a casual uh, interface as the rest of your life and family goes by in the background? Most of our team, actually three of us on the team were truly distributed before COVID anyway. Um, so we're happy to be this way. Uh, we do have a team member who is extremely extroverted and um, you can tell that she really misses the interaction. Uh, we do daily stand-ups, so we use Slack, and every morning we all go put what we're doing for the day, um, and that includes sort of our mood and any support that we might need. Um, we do uh, like team get-togethers on Zoom every couple of months. Um, there's some really interesting, I cannot think of the name of it now, I will do a search in a moment and try and find it, but there's some like online game sites that you can do that's just something away from only focusing on work and just having fun every now and then. There's, um, you can do a Google search for this, something called a user manual of me. So user manual of me is um, the team, sort of everybody on the team um, spend some time doing it and then sort of getting together to work through it. And it's just talking about like how, um, how I want to be communicated to, the hours that I want to work, um, things that people sort of need to know about me in the way that I work best. Um, and then ensuring that we all are really aware of, okay, this person sort of needs more, um, you know, Zoom time or, or less Zoom time or whatever it is, but really trying to take some time to understand everybody. Um, our team, uh, I'm very cognizant of not only who is being heard on the team, but what voices are not being represented. Um, our team was more visually diverse in the past. We, because we uh, are a little bit more creative in how we find people, we have a bit of a turnover. And so I'm kind of more aware when our team is not as visually um, diverse or visually, visual minorities are not as well represented. And we take, we're a bit more strategic in trying to find people that can speak for everybody. Like, making sure that all voices are kind of heard. Um, little things like, you know, um, putting the she, her next to your name so that, and everybody within the Ontario Digital Service sort of puts their pronouns and introduces themselves with their pronouns um, when they're meeting teams for the first time kind of thing. So that there's a, an openness that, you know, you can kind of be yourself, etc. cetera. Um, I think that, Kind of okay. that, yeah. Great. Um, uh, so again, a reminder for folks, if they want to ask any questions, the chat box is the place to go. I just got a new one. Thank you. But let's go back to one that uh, came in from Rebecca. Uh, she was asking Sasha, uh, really fascinated about the discussion about channel shifting. And can you just think about uh, or provide any examples and maybe others in the group can with regards to, ch to channels shifting during uh, digital. I'll give you one example in my mind. The simplest example is uh, try to pay with uh, uh, paper money. Uh, that was a channel shift that we've all embraced. Uh, I also believe that people will want not want to touch paper. They don't want to see paper forms anymore because paper conveys a certain lack of hygiene. Uh, so I'm seeing that. Uh, so I don't know what others are seeing. Any other examples? So first to you, Sasha. Uh, yeah, so I mean, I, you know, it's it's interesting. I mean, there's just like an infinity of questions that all of the sort of changes that have been forced um, by the public health measures required to address this pandemic. There are all these questions about how lasting the habit uh, uh, change will 
will be. I mean, I, I think it's hard to extrap extrapolate from an environment in which that behavior change is sort of necessary, right? Like physical locations are closed. Uh, there's very limited options to go into Service Canada, Service Manitoba, whatever the case may be. And how do you compare that with the decision environment in which we're sort of maintaining legacy channels and simply simply relying on sort of suasion uh, to shift people to, to digital service models? Um, so I think we'll, we'll need to sort of be careful um, as hopefully the pandemic eases. Um, I think we'll have to be careful about extrapolating, but I, I, honestly, I would turn to the other folks on the panel who, you know, know infinitely more than I do about, you know, digital government service on what, what are examples of how the transition has been affected well and what we can learn for that. To, to be honest, I, I don't have examples that come readily to mind for me. Sasha, I was just going to maybe pick up on your point for, for a minute. I, th I think two things. So one, I, th I think this is a really important and interesting question to me about how have some of the changes in terms of people's kind of individual behavior, how sticky is that going to be post-COVID? Um, and, I, and I do think, you know, even if you go back to that definition of digital that I had shared around people's raised expectations, I do think COVID has raised those expectations even further, right? I think we've got a whole cohort of Canadians who pre-COVID didn't do their banking online, you know, never bought groceries online, didn't do online purchases, um, they were forced to, and I think now, um, I think there is an open question to say to what degree now that people have been kind of forced to move some of their behaviors to kind of digital interaction with, you know, private sector companies, but also public entities, how much are they going to kind of demand that on an ongoing basis? Um, so I think that's a really interesting question, and we'll see more about that. You know, the other piece, and just an example on this, I think, you know, uh, from the federal government perspective, because I, I probably know them best and have been doing a fair bit of work with them in recent years and, and used to work with them. You know, if you look at the the CERB, the Canadian Emergency Response Benefit, right, I, I think in terms of as an example of an online delivery of, of one of these COVID response programs, it actually went fairly well from kind of a, a citizen facing perspective. There were a few hiccups, but largely speaking, I mean, you had millions of people in a very short period of time being able to, to sign up for this benefit. Um, there were some policy challenges on the back end in terms of how the program was constructed, but from a digital service delivery standpoint, um, actually fairly successful compared to, I think, comparative, you know, large scale digital delivery we've seen. But the big asterisk and caveat around that is, is that was in the heat of this extraordinary pressure and this extraordinary circumstances where resources could be thrown at this in, in, in kind of a way and, and processes got collapsed in a way um, that they don't normally do kind of the typical way we deliver services. So again, I think it remains to be seen. Some of those things that we learned um, through the COVID experience, how replicable are those going to be in kind of, you know, right, quote unquote, regular times? Um, and can we preserve some of the good parts of that uh, to kind of change the operating system for government going forward? Uh, Anna or Nikki, would you guys like to get in on this or should I go to another question? Up to you guys. I guess maybe the, the one thing I'll add, um, you know, in terms of like paradigm shifts, for COVID, you know, I, I remember reading this article when, you know, January 2019, uh, when, when we were first seeing the first couple of cases and some countries started to do lockdowns, you know, news media saying, you know, China is able to lock down, but Manitoba never is, it, like, or Canada never will, right? That's just not something within our repertoire as, you know, as a country. Um, and how quickly you know, governments have been able to pivot, how quickly people have been able to accept reality, or for lack of a better word, accept realities uh, that were previously kind of inconceivable. Um, and, you know, especially in the context of things like vaccination cards. And the reason that I bring this up is because in the context of data science, we always come against this question of like trust, right? Trust in data, trust in government's use of data, um, trust in the outcomes of data and data analytics. And I think COVID has really created um, a context for that narrative and that discussion and that debate to happen publicly, right? Like what, what will the public accept the government collecting? For what reasons can data legitimately be used? What kinds of decisions 
can data legitimately be used to inform? Um, you know, and how do we go forward? I think there's there's been this kind of uh, disconnect where the public trusts private sector companies like Google to collect mass amounts of information, but potentially, you know, not transferring over to government where, you know, the, the intent is really social good. So it's been, it's been a really interesting context, especially with, in, in the case of this debate about, you know, private data, how do we use it? How do we use it legitimately and how do we use it for good? Uh, excellent point. I'll just throw on one uh, comment there, and that is, um, if, it, if it wasn't for all of the phenomenal work that people had done around privacy and the maturity of the privacy frameworks, uh, that our ability to establish that and, and the ability to execute on those, we would never have had that trust. So, uh, you know, for I give hats off to the, the tireless work of people of the privacy community and, 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 and all the people behind that. And so that, that's just a, an excellent, interesting point. So sorry, I couldn't help myself. Anna. Um, I want to jump on to another, another question here. Um, um, uh, which I think has come through. Um, but yes, I'm going to put it in this way. And it relates to a question that came up about references for people to begin. Um, let me just sort of throw this out to you. Each of you spoke in your own way about um, skills and knowledge and um, getting up to speed or, or learning how to apply certain techniques, whether that would be uh, something as sophisticated as, as uh, you know, very high-end techniques of, of data science or to the application of, um, uh, of uh, you know, um, relatively, you know, powerful but, but relatively uh, doable concepts like A-B testing, Sasha, in your case. Uh, Ryan, you talked about the, nil, the need to kind of build uh, awareness and, and skills. And, and Nikki, that's what you've been all about, trying to get it out to thousands of public servants. But for the audience in the group here, that, that's attending, which represents a really interesting cross-section of, of public servants uh, in, in, in Manitoba, federal, provincial, and municipal, um, what, what are your sort of... Um, uh, observations or, or, or one or two recommendations you would make uh, for how to people to get engaged and to learn and to, um, I'm going to sort of advocate for um, a learn by doing, right? Because that is, that is the digital way that, 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 and just to make the point on that, um, with Nikki and I, we never asked for permission, we never sought any money, and we never ever talked to a lawyer. We just did it because we assessed that the risks were so low and there was nothing. The, the beauty of digital is that it does give you some of these opportunities to try some things very quickly and very easy. And you'll, you'll as they say, you fail fast, right? So anyway, your thoughts, and maybe I'll start with you, Nikki, this time. Um, there was a lot, the, the bottom line question is, um, Guy, what's the bottom line question? So what, what advice, what one or two things would you advise for the, the audience in terms of, of their skill sets and their knowledge? Um, really understand that we're all leaders. Um, often, like when, when our team um, does uh, courses, et cetera, we always sort of hear the same questions in our AMAs. It's how can I do this if my leadership isn't on board? And the answer is, well, realize that you are a leader. Like you can take a leader position without being a manager. I'm not in any way um, responsible for hiring, firing of people. Thank goodness for a lot of people. But, um, you know, I don't have any of that power, but I can still be a leader um, and bring forward ideas and be a little bit more creative in, in trying to solution something. Um, so that's the first one. Um, and some of our training, and I, I don't mean this negatively, but some of our training is, is we try to overcome the barriers that people sort of have. Um, you know, like, like I said, people sort of say, I'm not a leader, how can I do this if, if my leader isn't on board? And we try to get around those excuses by giving some concrete items for people, but like taking, having an understanding that we're all leaders and we all have the place and and there is things that we can do, even if they're small things to make changes. Bring ideas forward, like, um, you know, something as simple as a daily stand-up or a weekly stand-up or, or something that shows that you can show some benefit of working differently. Bring those ideas forward. Um, 
the the word that I hate the most because I can't spell it, but being an entrepreneur, like, you know, think, how do I be an entrepreneur within the constraints of what, what I have? And so just trying to do new things differently um, and not always asking permission, as Guy sort of said, like, you know, putting forward some ideas, but just trying something behind the scenes and, and finding something that works and then taking the wins forward. That's to me. Nice. Uh, Sasha, how about your, your take on this? Yeah. Um, you know, so I think that most folks working in policy, sort of uh, service design, digital government would, you know, materially benefit from uh, familiarity with sort of key concepts in behavioral science or some of the most sort of important um, uh, findings from the behavioral science literature that can be applied day to day. So things like simplification and, you know, I can certainly give recommendations either here in the chat or offline on the sort of best resources. I think, you know, there are some risks of going too far uh, with implementation of behavioral insights interventions without sort of deep expertise. There are some situations and contexts in which these ideas can backfire, even something like simplification. There are actually, right now we're working with a securities regulator and we're looking at some of the risks of making like online trading for personal investors uh, too easy. Because there may be actually some aspects of your day in which it's good to have a little bit of friction and give some things a little bit of second thought. Um, and so, uh, uh, you know, I think it's this balance between understanding some of the basic findings in the field, knowing what the field is and sort of when and how to access it, but also having access to specialized expertise when you and your colleagues have identified uh, an opportunity to really go deep with applied behavioral um, science. And so, you know, the federal government has set up a number of centralized teams, British Columbia, Ontario, others hire consulting organizations like mine or work with academics. There's no one uh, right answer, but I think it's about sort of understanding the basics and becoming, you know, good at interfacing with more specialized partners and, and groups when this is, you know, a really sort of key methodology or discipline for achieving your goals. There's also stuff on the side you mentioned about AB trials and evaluations. That is generally a more technical skill set. Um, and there, uh, there is often a need for people to have a strong undergraduate or basic graduate school knowledge of, um, of uh, sort of statistical um, uh, analysis. I mean, nothing so advanced as what Anna uh, and the folks on her team uh, would have, but sort of a, a basic uh, understanding of, of, of sort of causal inference and statistical methods in order to do uh, that aspect of the work um, uh, rigorously. So, sorry, there's so much more I could say about different capacity building models. And a lot of my team's work is helping partners develop their own uh, behavioral insights uh, teams and, and capabilities. But I just, I, I want to sort of hit the, try to hit the right level for the discussion here and, and also just give time to the other uh, presenters. Super. Uh, Ryan, maybe a couple of minutes from you, and then we'll see if there's some other questions. Yeah, no, thanks. Thanks, Guy. And, and, you know, just kind of building on this a little bit, I mean, I think as Sasha was, was rightly saying, you know, there, there are some areas where you probably do want to have some deep expertise. And I think increasingly there are options out there, whether it's behavioral insights or data science, user research, where there are programs that you can kind of go deep and build up expertise. And so I do think you do need, in some cases, access to these real experts, you know, who can go deep in their domains, whether it's inside government or whether you have access to that expertise from the outside. But I, I would argue, and I'm a big advocate, that there is kind of a base level of digital literacy that I think every public servant needs today. Um, you know, and a lot of the work that, that I do and, and uh, we do through the Institute on Governance tends to be with managers and executives. And I think particularly at that level, you know, we're not necessarily saying that people have to be a data scientist. They don't have to have, you know, deep 
expertise in how to do, you know, open source computer coding, for example. But I do think there is this notion, and, and there's this term I really like um, of technical intuition that was coined by um, uh, a woman by the name of Alex Dunn, who writes uh, on issues around digital and, and does work on that in the UK. And I'll actually put a link to the article that she had written about this in the chat, because it always really resonated with me. And, I, and to me, this kind of idea of technical intuition is that I think people, and particularly public service leaders, need to have an understanding of what the limits and the possibilities are of technology. And to be really frank, to be able to have the ability to call BS on something when they have to do it, right? I mean, that's ultimately that challenge function that we call upon our leadership and government to play is to be able to ask the right questions and make informed decisions. And increasingly, there is no area of policy and no area of service delivery in government that doesn't have a digital underpinning to it. I mean, you think about any policy issue you're dealing with, you think about any service delivery challenging you're having, there is going to be some issue, some sub part of that that has to do with technology that has to do with this kind of broad term of digital. And I, and I think the more that we get leaders in government who are at least comfortable with understanding intuitively how the digital world works, it's going to lead them to be able to make better decisions and, and fulfill their roles more effectively. So I am, so I am, you know, pretty passionate about the notion that not everyone has to have deep technical expertise, but I think everyone in public service increasingly has to have this baseline understanding of how the digital world works if they're going to be an effective public servant in 2021. Okay, and um, I and I want to give you a chance to get into this. I uh, my uh, I know you're the, the the last of the four, but just your your thoughts in terms of and, and you're out there dealing with uh, deputies to uh, to clerks, uh, frontline staff, um, um, using a range of techniques. So just interesting, your thoughts, Anne. Yeah, thanks. I'll I'll go quickly just so we have time to. Uh you know, to talk through some of the other questions that might come up. Um, but so I think like, when you think about government as a system or an organization, you know, you need, and thinking about data um, and digital, different levels of the organization need different skills, right? So for somebody like a deputy minister or a clerk, you know, the, the skill set is really understanding the value of data, being able to understand um, you know, quantitative information when it's presented in layman's terms, like, you know, the work that we do in house within data science, yes, it is technical, but as soon as that deliverable and the code is complete, all of that gets backgrounded. And what our client actually sees are easily digestible pieces of information with very clear and actionable policy outcomes, right? So you really have to, um, in doing this work kind of understand where that technical work happens and then where that knowledge communication or that science communication happens and to present to decision makers you know the implications of your results the actionable outcomes of those results but also the caveats right and explain you know what this data can say and what this data cannot say um on on the question of how can areas or kind of individuals start to implement this um, you know, I'll, I'll depart a little bit from, from my colleagues here and say that, you know, data science sounds like a really scary and difficult thing to do. Part of that is a sales pitch from data scientists and from companies that, you know, say that only a certain kind of person or a certain kind of analyst can do this work. Um, that's not the case. These skills are 100% teachable and learnable. There are infinite amounts of resources available for free that will allow somebody to start, you know, fiddling and messing with, with some of these techniques. Uh, open source software means that you no longer have to purchase extremely expensive licenses, uh, you know, that are kind of privatized. You can download R or Python, watch a couple of YouTube videos, or even, you know, I'll plug the, uh, the workshops that data science is developing for free and start to get your fingers on the keyboard and start doing some of this. Um, the other thing I'll say is, you know, when we think about data and big data, again, that sounds like something scary, but, you know, I would encourage folks to realize the fact that you use data and pieces of information every single day, right? Like it, when you read three newspaper articles or you're doing a jurisdictional scan, you know, you are collecting pieces of information aggregating that knowledge, 
and then delivering that general finding. That is exactly the same thing that we do when we do data science, except we have a lot more data points to work with. And the data science techniques that we use, you know, 90% of the work goes into, you know, combining a large amount of data and making it usable. All of the really complicated methodologies like machine learning models and decision trees, you know, statistical inferential models, all of that is done by two or three lines of code. Like in order to make that data, the outcomes understandable, and in order for you to do this correctly, of course, you have to understand what you're doing. You have to understand the caveats, the limitations of your methodology, but the actual doing portion of it is 100% learnable and really is just an extension of the type of learning or information gathering that we do in our daily lives when we read, um, you know, when we engage with stakeholders, uh, when we do jurisdictional scans and so on. Wow. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I, I can't help but, but put in a plug because of some of the stuff that I'm involved in, but the simplification and moving to no code drag and drop uh, um, real time analytics capabilities is, is where the industry is going. So the need to be able to code in R or SPSS is, is rapidly diminishing as a, as a pre requirement for getting involved. So these things, as you say, are becoming easier and easier, but you need to sit back and, and think and use what you've always been asked to do with public servants is to, to do a bit of research and to use some good judgment. But it, I, I, I like where you're going with that. We are kind of coming to the end of the time. Um, uh, we're at 125. I'd like to just see if there's anybody would like to make any sort of uh, 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 closing comments or thoughts on what they've heard, uh, each of the four of you. I'd like to, you know, first of all, thank you all. Um, and I want to give a, a real big shout out to Angela uh, Colombage, who uh, was kind of the inspiration behind this session. I know she hasn't been feeling 100% lately, so she wasn't as engaged uh, lately, but I can see that she's listening. Hopefully you're feeling better, Angela. But any, any last comments that we would uh, offer uh, uh, listeners? Um, um, and uh, hey, way to go, Angela. You got a shout out. Well done. Uh, oh, Angela's got a, wants to say something maybe, uh, or a hands up. Angela, if you want to unmute and say something, have a, have a, have at it. No, I just, I just uh, clicked an icon to say great job, great presentation. And thank you very much all for attending. Ryan, Sasha, Nikki, Anna, and Guy. Thank you very much. Okay. Well, you know what, folks? I think we've covered pretty much everything we wanted today. So with that, I think what we'll do is we'll wrap up and let people uh, get to their stuff. Everybody's, uh, the information, the, the session's going to be recorded, made available. The slides are embedded, even though I'm sorry, Anna, it took a couple of minutes to get yours loaded. Um, but you know where to find everybody. These are amazing resources. Please reach out. Uh, and tap into them. And obviously, uh, if you want to ask uh, 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 anything about IPAC, uh, fantastic organization, Emmett and Angela and others are, and uh, I know um, uh, uh, Jessica Dracul is probably still heavily involved. So uh, thanks very much, everyone. And I wish everybody has, a, hope everybody has a great rest of their day. Bye-bye.